Welcome to the Rock the Stage Show. Each week, international media expert Rich Bontrager has in-depth and personal conversations with celebrities, top leaders, authors, speakers, and media professionals. Now, from the Rock the Stage studios, here's your host, the Trigger, Rich Bontrager. Welcome back. It's Sunday night, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, and we're ready for another edition of Rock to Stage Show. Thanks for dropping on in, whether you're on PPN, our global streaming network, or we're on YouTube. Thanks for taking the time to drop on in. And by the way, if you are on YouTube tonight, the live chat party is underway as we live stream it together. So please jump in the chat, ask some questions, and send us some love along the way as well. We're in for a great really great conversation here tonight i have long wanted to get my this guy on the show and we finally got him thank you through my wonderful celebrity handler um uh, robert stack robert does an amazing job as you know bringing great guests in here and we finally hooked a big 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 fish <laughs> it's gonna be a great conversation but let me ask you have you had a bad experience from service from shopping to dinner out whatever customer service is so important i've worked a lot in that area over my life, but it seemed that customer service is dropping and dropping. In fact, I had a recent really bad experience. And then I got the receipt, the check to make my payment. And they already wanted 20%. They already took 20%. So I did not give a tip. Is that good? Is that wrong? Is that bad? But customer service is so, so important. Maybe you read the book, Good to Great by Jim Collins years ago. I read that. I read that. Set a standard for it. But my guest tonight actually believes being good, being great, no, no longer enough. You got to be iconic. And that includes customer service and every other industry that we're involved with now. You want to stand out from the crowd. My guest tonight is a global recognized authority on organizations and professionals create distinction to attract and retain customers and stand out from the hyper-competitive marketplace. He is the author of a book named by 30 major newspapers as one of the best top 10 books. And his latest book is called Iconic, was named by Forbes.com as one of the top 10 best business books of the year as well. He is one of the 24 members. Only 24 people have made it into the Sales and Marketing Hall of Fame. And after thousands of presentations in all 50 states, 23 countries, he was honored recently to become the member of the Professional Speakers Hall of Fame. And most recently, he received the highest award you can get in the NSA, the Cavett Award winner. Without any further ado, here comes the rock star himself, Scott McCain. Man, I <laughs> hope my wife has this on in the other room because I really want her to hear all this good stuff you just said. <laughs> <laughs> I need the help. By the way, I got to show you something. I, I hadn't planned on this. Look what came in with by UPS today. And that is oh, the Cabin Award from the National Speakers Association. And it just arrived and it's here on my desk. <laughs> you know, because after the convention's over, it's so heavy. I mean, the thing weighs almost oh, 50 yeah. pounds. <laughs> after it's over, they, you know, they realize you're not going to carry it home. You can't get it through security. So they ship no. it to you. So it just came in. So you're, you're the first person I've had a chance to share that with. So. Look at that, uh, folks. We uh, always get the best people and the live of the moment stuff right here on Rock the Stage. That's why you got to be here. <laughs> so there you Scott, go. Congratulations on that. And I do want to touch deep on that in just a moment. But before, did you not? Did you know that you and I share something in common? No. I mean, I, I, I don't doubt it with all the experiences that you've had. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm anxious to find out what it is. Well, we we both have broadcasting careers, of course. Yeah. But I grew up in Elkhart, Indiana. I did not know that. And where did you but, grow up? I, I grew up in Crothersville, Indiana, <laughs> in the southern part of the state. But here's another thing. I have a, I have a friend, Todd, Todd Bontrager who uh, is is from that area. So I don't know if you know him, but I mean, there, there, there's a lot of folks in the Elkhart area with your last name. It's, oh, it's, yeah, no, Bontrager in the upper part of the country is yeah. all over the place. Um, yeah. I, back in the day of phone books, you remember phone books? Oh, yeah. We, we had like 10 pages of Bontrager's in the phone book. <laughs> <laughs> but well, I did that, not know that either until just recently. I learned you were a, federal, a, a fellow Hoosier. 
Yeah, you bet. Well, it's so funny. I've, I've got buddies, uh, some of my best pals are in a country music band called Diamond Rio. And uh, they played in Shipshawana, Indiana this last weekend. So we went over to see them. We were hanging with them. And they did a, they did a drawing before. And the person from Shipshawana, which is not all that far from Elkhart, said, how much you want to bet the winner of the drawing is either a Bontrager or a Yoder? <laughs> <laughs> those the, you know, it's like Smith and Jones, most places. You know? That's exactly how it was. And Ship Schwanner was my camp growing up. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. So fantastic. And, and I love Diamond Real. Those guys are fantastic. Yeah, they're but the greatest I, guys. I do want to talk about, uh, you have had an amazing career. You have been a true rock star to the microphone, the stage. Oh, oh, winning the Cabot Award. Again, we're both NSAers, National Speakers Association. That Cabot Award says so much about you. I mean, it's really for your outstanding work as a speaker, but the, the, the credit you have, the respect you have, the honor, admiration of your fellow speakers, what's it like to get that and literally recognize, because you know what that Cabot Award means. So they say, Scott McCain, Cabot. I still can't believe it's true. You know, I mean, I, I opened up that package and got that award and, and uh, it was like, I think they, they sent this to the wrong house. You know, the, the, <laughs> the funny thing is, and I've always wondered, you know, because they always say the cabinet award winner does not know, and it's, it's going to be a surprise, you know, cause it's the, the biggest award in our association. And they called my name and there was like this second where I thought, did they really say me? You know, and because the other thing that popped in my head is how bad would it be if I stood up and then somebody else walked by you know, to go up on stage? I'm like, oh yeah, way to go! Uh, I, I got to tell you a quick story too. The other funny thing was they told my wife ahead of time, <gasps> yeah, because they wanted her to go backstage so that when I came up stage, then she would be able to come, you know, onto the stage. Yes. And there was an entertainment thing before they made the award. They presented the Hall of Fame awards in a small entertainment thing. And she, you know, during the last two Hall of Fame presentations said, I've really got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and I'm like, you can't leave during the Hall of Fame. You know, we're having this little, you know, you can't leave during this thing. She said, okay, well, when the entertainment starts and the, and the lights go down, then, then I'll go. Yeah, oh, good idea. You know, so lights go down, the entertainment thing starts. She goes to the, I think goes to the bathroom and you can tell the entertainment things. Lit. So I start texting, get back in here. We got to see who wins the cabot. You know, this is the big moment. Of it. And then they call my name and I'm walking up the stage going biggest honor of my life. And my wife is in the bathroom and won't see this. And then she walks on stage. And then I thought, you know, I don't know if it's a good thing that my wife can keep such a secret. <laughs> <You> know, because, <laughs> yeah. But I'm I'm so glad she did, and it was it just made it perfect to walk up on stage and her being there, and it, it was just uh, Rich. I, I can't describe it. It was just one of the just most special things that's ever happened to me. And and uh, you know, th then you go to bed that night and you lay there in bed and you think, you know, where they telling me, okay, we've seen enough of you. Thanks. <laughs> Here's your exit package. I I, I said the speech. I, I think I still got a little runway left. You know. But, uh, <sighs> It's, no, no, no. Uh, this is not a fade off sunset. This is just uh, your, your career is amazing. I followed your career. I've seen you in action and a well-deserved award for a guy that does exhibit cat to the world. You, no, you hands good. down do it, buddy. Well, it works both ways, my friend. I look forward to cheering you on there someday as well. So thank well, you. Well, let's get into you because again, this whole customer service journey it's gone wonky around the world now. I, I think it's out of control, but I like how you're getting this area of being distinctive. Let's start there yeah. because Jim Collins wrote that great book, Good to Great. Everyone chewed it up. Everyone applied it to their business or lives, anything they do. But as I teased up, that's not enough anymore. You have to be distinctive to stand out in the crowd. What do you mean by that when you talk about that? Well, I you know, I, I, I went through a personal tragedy in my life. I, I lost my first wife to cancer and I put my speaking business on hold for a period of time to be her sole caregiver. And, you know, we didn't have kids in, in our first marriage and, and she had just taken a job in California. So we'd moved there. So we really didn't know people there. So I had to shut everything down and, and do that. And also because of uh, the way insurance was at the time, she had quit her job 
because of a disagreement and, and something where she absolutely should have, but she quit on the spot. And then three days later, cancer was discovered, which meant it was a pre-existing condition and now we can't get insurance. Oh. And so we, we lost everything. And at the time of her passing, I was, I was over seven figures in debt and no clients, you know, cause I cut the speaking business back to just one client. And that was a financial services firm who said, if you file bankruptcy, we can't use you anymore. Ooh. So, you know, there, there came a point in my life, you've got to decide if you're going to stay down or get up and staying down didn't sound like an option. So I, I thought, okay, if I'm going to rebuild my business, um, how, how do I do that? Yeah. And I, I read where Jeff Bezos said, uh, your brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a great quote, but I also realized it also meant you weren't in the room to hear <laughs> what they were saying. Right. So, <laughs> so I thought, okay, so what would be the second best thing? It would probably be to go to clients and say, when you refer me, when you recommend me, what do you say? Yeah. Because that would really tell you what, what they're saying about you and what your brand is. So I went to the speakers bureaus I had worked with in the past. And I said, when, when, when you recommend me, what do you say? And their answer almost unanimously was, we tell people you're a good speaker and a nice guy. Now, I want to be a good speaker and I, I, I want to be a nice guy. But, but, you know, think of your favorite company booking the meeting and they don't say, hey, for this year's convention, let's get, let's get somebody nice. Yeah, you know, they, they well, it's kind of melt it, it is it it's, yeah. it's really doesn't match at all. No, it's so bland. It's so average. Um, so then I thought, okay, how do I differentiate myself? Mm -hmm. Then the thing occurred to me that I could slap every client in the face and it would make me different. <laughs> but but it wouldn't get me referrals. It would give me repeat business. So I thought there had to be something beyond just being different. Yeah. Uniqueness is a great quality, but only yeah. if it has meaning and value for your customers. And I thought, what is what is above different? And that would be distinct. Yeah. And that's where the idea came to me about distinction is when there is something about what you do mm -hmm. that is so meaningful to customers, it makes you stand out. And so that's what I set out for my own business. And then the blinding flash, the obvious was if my little business needed it, what were the chances other businesses might be looking for this as well? Exactly. It, it started me on the path of doing research about it and, and learning about it, uh, developing case studies about it and, and really approaching it differently than how I'd approached my content in the past. Well, and have the idea of being a distinctive, strong restaurant yeah. store, whatever, is one thing, but now everyone's added in social media and true media, like I often do as a broadcaster, everyone's being pulled in a new directive and there's so much noise, so much distraction, so much bad, wasted content. No one's distinctive unless you intentionally learn to stand out through the noise. Yes. So how exactly. do we do that? How do we break through and be distinctive? Because you want to be kind of sort of like other people, but you also want to be set apart. How do we do that? Well, I, I say there's a four step process to it and I call them the four cornerstones of distinction. And the first of the four is clarity. You've got to be absolutely precise about who you are and what you do and what makes you unique in the marketplace. And it, it, it always strikes me because we keep hearing that you have to think outside the box, but yet yeah. uh, most people don't even know what the box is to begin with, right? They can't define the box. So then we're telling them to think outside it. Heck, they don't even know what the box is. We right. haven't been clear enough. You, you'll love it. I, I was doing a program a while back in Ohio and it was a, a small group. It was like a consulting day on distinction. And uh, the CEO had read one of my books and he said, you know, I think we're really clear. So you, let, let's spend more time on the other cornerstones. You don't have to do clarity. And I said, well, can I just pour the foundation, you know, give me, I, 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 we'll make a course corrections as we go, but let me just hit that to, to do the four in order. Okay. Yeah. He's kind of reluctant, but okay. So I gave everybody a three by five inch note card and I said, write a sentence about what makes you unique in the marketplace. If someone said, why should we do business with you as opposed to your competition, write down what makes you unique. And there were 12 people in the room and there were 10 different answers. And the CEO sat there flabbergasted. Yes. And 
He said, I thought because I was clear about it that my people were clear about yes. it. And it's not true. And by the way, the other challenge I made to the CEO was, are your customers clear about it? You know, if you've got 10 different answers of, of the dozen leaders in yes. the room, then there's no way that they're communicating all singing from the same sheet for your customers. So no. and, and, and the other aspect of this, Rich, is, and, and this is the other one that's really hard for, for individuals and organizations, you got to be really clear about what you're not. We fall into this trap of saying me too, or, oh, you know, somebody has a, a project. Let's, let's think about an entrepreneur for a minute. And, and somebody comes to this small business person and says, you know, here's something we'd really like for you to do. And it's not exactly what the company, his little business does, but he sees this check dangling out there. And, and, and then you spend more time being something you're not than something that you are. And, it becomes so important to define both of those. Well, and, and that's a great point. I'm really glad you brought that up. You're the top tier leaders in my mind. You have to repeat what you are, your values, your mission, whatever it is, far more than people think that you think they need to hear it. You need exactly. to double. Like it used to be, say things seven times, you'll learn it. No, 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 no. We're like 14, 15, 18 times. The leader's got to beat it, own it, who's out of themselves. You, you got to demonstrate that much for your people to get it. And the vice versa, to your point, you got to let your people know we don't do that. I'm okay saying no to that because yes. we're going to be great at this and shiny object. People love the next shiny object. They all want to get in on it. It's okay to say no, right? Yeah. Oh, I, I, several years ago, I had the privilege of doing some work for and with Arnold Schwarzenegger and got to spend some time with him one-on-one -on -one. and and I, I finally got up the care you know the curry he's a little bit intimidating as you might yeah imagine. you think <laughs> so it was just the two of us alone i got the chance to ask him i said you know what what's the secret how, how did you become at one point the biggest movie star in the world i mean yeah. you, you don't look like the typical movie star you know you, you don't look like uh, brad pitt you, you've got an accent you know yep. how, how did this happen and he said, most people don't know that I, I basically was a millionaire before I started acting through the bodybuilding. Then I sold yeah. supplements. Then I used the supplement money to buy real estate in Southern California and then rental properties. He said, I owned and was renting better properties than what I was living in. Wow. But I wanted to get the financial security because he said, in any business, the most powerful word you can say as an owner is no. And when I said no to people, you know, most actors will take anything. He said, how many actors do you see that their third movie is a flop? Yeah. And I never really thought about that before. He said, what happens is their first movie is a hit and now they're a star. People are treating them great and they buy the big house and they buy the big car and second movie does great. So they buy a bigger house and a bigger car. And now you've got to maintain that lifestyle you think, and you've got to maintain that. And so you take, you say yes to something that's a lot of money, but not something that will advance your career. He said, I didn't have to worry about that. I could say no, which he said, by the way, in the long run, makes people want you more. So good to great, yeah. now distinctive, but you talk about being iconic, which I absolutely love that. Thank you. Yeah. Some people think it's an easy rubber stamp to become I iconic. We talk about the iconic stand-up comedians. We think about Jerry Lewis, Dean Martin. We think of those iconic figures. And we think, I, I want to be iconic. That does not happen overnight, does it? No, it, it doesn't. And and I'll tell you how it, how it came about was uh, a group that went through the transformational process of distinction uh, is the Fairmont Scottsdale Princess. I was doing some work with Fairmont Hotels and uh, Jack Miller, the CEO there said, well, what if we did a project here where we created distinction? What can we do? Yes. And it, it, it was a great process because part of what we all realized is, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't make the, the hotel distinctive. What you do is you break it down. How can we make the front desk and check-in distinctive? How can we have distinctive housekeeping? How do we have a distinctive gift shop? And then when all of those parts think about what they can do to create distinction, then the result is the total property uh, becomes distinctive. So they went yeah. through the process, um, they got named best resort in America. Jack Miller won the best hotel executive in the world. 
Uh, they've got the lowest turnover in, in the hospitality industry. They're the most profitable of all of the Fairmont hotels anywhere in the world. And so we're kind of celebrating, we're having breakfast and Jack says, all right, we're distinctive. What's next? <laughs> I sat there and went, uh, you know, I, I'd written a book about how do we create it, but I hadn't written a book about what the next level was yes. or how you keep it or whatever. And, and Jack leaned back and laughed and he says, all right, we're going to be iconic. And I thought that's it. And, and what I realized was the definition of distinction is that you stand out in your marketplace. Mm -hmm. You're the most distinctive car dealer in Indianapolis, or yep. you're the most uh, unique, distinctive restaurant in Louisville. But iconic means that you transcend your category. Yes. You become an example across the board. Yes. And so one of the things I realized as I look now at what they've done there, for example, with the Fairmont Scottsdale Princess, um, is that there are other businesses in Arizona and really throughout the, the Southwest that will go there to see how they do it and think about, okay, how do we make our, you know, law firm like they've made theirs? And we did some in interesting research, Rich. Uh, we, we asked customers two questions. Okay. We said, when you do business, what do you want? And at the places where you do business, what are you getting? Trying to identify where the gaps were. Yep. So the results started coming in and we were, you know, discriminating. This is, this is automotive. This is hospitality. This is financial services. And the blinding flash of the obvious was the, the answers were all the same. Didn't matter the industry. So what we found was that customers don't judge you just against who you think your competition is. Customers judge you based on the totality of experiences that you've had. Say so, that again, please just, just say yeah. that again. People don't know that. Customers don't judge you against who you perceive to be your competition. They judge you based upon the totality of experiences that they've had. So in other words, when I'm at a restaurant, if, if, I go there frequently, but yet they don't remember my name, but yet my dry cleaners does. Yes. And it welcomes me with a big smile and knows who I am. Well, why, why can't they? If my dry cleaner can do it, the restaurant can do it, I'll go someplace else where they will. Yeah. Right. I'm 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 not judging the restaurant against other restaurants. I'm judging it saying, hey, you know, I go to my dry cleaners once a week. I've been coming in this restaurant every, once every couple of weeks. And you, you still act like you don't know who we are. You, yeah. you don't you don't value us as a customer. So years ago, I read Behind the Magic Kingdom, ah. which, which I'm guessing Fabulous. you probably have. Fabulous. But yeah. the idea of every night when the park is closed, we fix every scrape, everything that wobbled, any glass that broke, any lights that's flickering. Every day they want you to come back into the same standard that was the day before, the day before, to the day they opened up the park. And they set a standard of this is going to be magical. Every kid deserves a magical experience. And every parent knows because I've gone enough where I still love freaking out. And <laughs> yeah, I'm a kid. That's something that Disney himself instilled in it. This will be the best park bar none. And my people are going to help make sure that standard never falls off. That's great leadership. That's great vision. That's now you have people on your team buying into it that we want to be iconic. Disney yeah. is the most iconic park in the universe. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, you know, I was on a program with the Disney Institute and they brought in this gentleman. I, I, I think he was 85, something like that. But he was a young man and he worked when Disneyland opened. He was one of the crew that helped put it together and open it. Yeah. And so one person in the audience said, okay, so you were there when the park opened and before the park opened, what, what was the most profound experience that you had? And he said, well, it was about three days before the park opened and I'd finished for the day and I was walking through, you know, down one of the streets. Of course it's deserted yeah. because, you know, and he said, I looked and there was a man I could see from the back and there was like a piece of paper on the ground and he was picking up that piece of paper and putting it in the trash and he turned around and it was Walt Disney. Yes. And he said, I realized if Walt Disney would stop and pick up a piece of paper on the ground, right. 
how could how could I or anyone else here not do that? I think it was someone else's job. And and he's and that was his message to this group is that you know it, it we, we lead more by example than by our words. And if we're not setting a distinctive and iconic example for our team and for our customers, why in the world would we think our our employees would do it when we don't? And it's still true to today. Yeah. Not just then, it's probably even more because we are saturated and saturated with so much sure. choice, opportunity, and you have to be distinctive in what you do, iconic, yeah. and you have to know what you do. So I want to drill down a little bit deeper on this. Sure. You've got five factors I know of being an iconic performance and what you do. And I'm, I'm just going to fly over these, but give me some feedback on this. The yeah. phrase we've always heard blank is a killer for dreamers, visionaries, but why do we keep saying it? We, we've always heard it that way or yeah. what? Uh, it, because it stifles thought, it stifles innovation, it stifles creativity. The, 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 first, the first of the five factors is to play offense. And that means you have to do it a different way. It, saying that we've always done it this way means that the, the defense is gonna be able to handle whatever it is you're doing. Right. Uh, it, it, when you're playing offense, so and that and that was one of the big decisions that I learned from from the Fairmont Scottsdale Princess was if if they one of the things that, that, that Jack Miller said is you know I realized that every moment I spent watching my competition wasted a moment I could be innovating to make them irrelevant. Yes. I wrote that down as soon as he said that. I just thought that's that is so so great and and so he said you know. Th the thing is, if if I was watching what the Four Seasons was doing, then I, I could only hope for second place because I would be governed by their behavior. Yes. yes. Not not creating new behavior of our own. And so that's one of the things he he won't he won't permit there. And I, I know other leaders that say the same thing. That once you say we've always done it that way, then the challenge that the leader has to say is, well, great, now it's your responsibility to find a better way. Well, and again, going back to Disney, he yeah. called them Imagineers. Yep. And he would call them in the room and say, here's my idea. There are absolutes I want in this, but I don't care how you get it done. Yeah. Just create this vision. Yeah. And they went wild, going way out of the box for things and coming back, well, this didn't work. Well, but this did work and this sort of worked. So we're going to do this one. He gave them the freedom to advance the company instead of straining them in and saying, we don't do that. I, that's such a perfect example, Rich, because I, the the second of the four cornerstones of distinction is creativity. Yep. And part of what I've talked to groups about is creativity to me is the stimulation of new ideas. Yes. Innovation is the leader taking from this pool of ideas and selecting which we're going to invest in yes. and which we're going to execute to move us forward in the marketplace. But the problem is, if there isn't the work at creativity to come up with all these ideas, then your choices for innovation are are narrowed dramatically. Mm -hmm. So if you don't encourage all of your team to be creative, yes. you, you're not going to have enough great choices to make to, to determine what's going to be innovative. It's Let me move on to another one of your iconic performance factors here, which I absolutely love, but this one may... Be a painful one for some people out there. Yeah. Stop selling. <laughs> yeah, you ought to you ought to be standing on a stage at a sales conference, and, and when I put that slide up before I say anything, you can see everybody. You know, the, especially the chief sales officer's face turns red. Well, uh, and look. you and I are both <laughs> keynote speakers. We've been on stage. Yes. One of my biggest fubas I hate seeing is speakers who are rocking it, and then in the middle they drop an info commercial about buying this right in the middle of it. It breaks the rhythm, the vision, the heartbeat is pumping with you on a journey. And then they go, by the way, for 1995. <laughs> the meaning of life is, oh, my time is almost up. Well, yeah, I, I just have to have these books in the back of the room. Right. Yeah. I, we are bombarded with sales messages, you know, and, and uh, our, our colleague Jeffrey Gittimer uh, says it best when he says, you know, nobody loves to be sold, but people love to buy. And 
it, it just strikes me, you know, you'll never see Apple saying, hey, big Labor Day sale. We stack them deep and sell them cheap. You know, uh, you, you just don't see the really iconic companies pushing. No. Because it, one case study I did is a restaurant in Indianapolis, St. Elmo Steakhouse. And have you, have you been there? Yeah, I have been. <laughs> it's amazing. It is. But what the what the president of that company uh, told me, uh, the Hughes family, H U S E owns it, and they said, "What our our big idea was? What if we took a job being a waiter that typically it was a transitory job? You know, you did it to mm -hmm. help pay your way through college, or you know, it was your side hustle. What if we made it a profession?" And they call them intrapreneurs inside the restaurant, intrapreneurs. And so the waiter's job is to give you such an incredible experience that you want to return. So every waiter has a business card that he presents you or she presents you at the end of the meal saying, I would love to have you come back and be at my table. So here's the number. Ask for me. I'll make certain you're in my section. Because I would, so now the waiter is incentivized to create a great experience, but because that great experience gets a bigger tip, they have ownership of their tables in, in, a, in a manner of speaking. And they told me one of the biggest line item expenses at, at St. Elmo restaurant is that every year they give you a bottle of wine that is of the vintage of when you started working there. And he said, try to find a bunch of 72 Cabernet because they don't leave. They're making six figures a year. They never leave because they have created this innovative way, this distinctive, iconic way yeah. of, of, of treating people internally. So that delivers externally for the customers. And it, every business, it's not just other restaurants. I mean, there, there's eight other steakhouses within an eight block range of radius of St. Elmo. Uh, Morton's just closed and left town because they couldn't keep well, St. Elmo is one of the 15 highest grossing restaurants in America, in Indianapolis. You'd think it'd be New York or Chicago or, yeah. you know, L.A. A steakhouse in Indianapolis, it's, it's, it's just killing it. Oh. And it's, it's the total experience they create for the customer, but realizing if you don't create this ultimate employee experience, you're not, never going to have the ultimate customer experience. So that also partly illustrates one of your other factors of the promise and the performance. Yeah, right. You're yeah. you're making a promise to your client, your customer. You start treating them like family, and the promise is, you come on back again, and you get me again, and we get it all over again. Yep. People love that personal touch. They love it and the personal yeah. connection. Right, right. And see, there, there you go. The, the 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 those two fit together. Yes, it's not apparent at the beginning, but when you start talking about it. Because if I, if I stop selling and start focusing on experiences, then not only will customers come back and spend more money, but they will also give me referrals. Look at us right now talking about St. Elmo, right? I mean, it, it, it's it, a free we, commercial for me. It's, it's a free commercial, good. right? It's the best. And, and it's credible because it's you and me talking about we had a great experience there. It's not them buying a commercial somewhere and, and, and selling you and telling you, you know, hey, best steak in town. You're making no. me hungry. <laughs> yeah. that shrimp cocktail with a horseradish sauce that'll set you free but I'm a, I'm, and that's I'm a, and that's the promise and performance too is yes. that those are the only two criteria that any customer judges us on yeah. is what do they perceive that we've promised that we'll do and then how do we perform based on that promise and in a lot of organizations the problem is the people making the promise aren't the people that are delivering the performance no and so there's this huge gap between and cut and see business. I'm on, I'm on my soapbox. I apologize. Businesses are structured vertically, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you have a sales department, you have a service department, you have the finance department, you have right customers experience this horizontally. So if I'm at a car dealership mm -hmm. and the service department lets me down, I don't say, wow, that dealership has a poor service department. But their sales department's really good. I think I'll go buy another car from them. We we say I, I'm going to find a better dealership. It'll take care of me yeah. because we experience this horizontally. And so what happens is that leaders that have not been through this transformation look at look at each of these silos and how they are individually performing, 
and then wondering why the customers aren't as loyal as they used to be. And they go, well, I guess we need more marketing. I guess we need more, you know, never thinking that it's, it's the gaps that that's killing them. Customers experience. We want to feel it, taste it, touch it, sense it. And if the waiter is that good, I'm going to come back and say, Hey, is Susie working tonight? I want to make sure I see Susie and we will seek them out and then they'll come back and they'll go, have you been at my table before? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely amazing. I want want to uh, do one more here. Okay. But, and again, this one also going to push some buttons. Most of the time we're told in business, in life and careers to stay positive, but you think being iconic is about going negative. Yeah. What's that all about? (laughs) Well, first off going negative doesn't mean that we become negative people. It means that we are so confident. Now notice the first one is to play offense. Yeah. So we're, we're going to be confident that we are playing offense and now we are going to be aggressive in finding where the friction is and where we're missing the mark. Uh, Let me use your restaurant example, because Rich, you've you've identified one of the, one of the best ones. So you, you're dissatisfied, right? And you know, the, the, a lot of times we know the manager walks by the table, Hey, how are we doing? And you just go, Oh, yeah, it's fine. And then you, you, you say to your person you're dining with, well, I'll never come back here again. Right. I mean, so, right. But if you do say, you know, this steak was not prepared the way I wanted it or the potato was cold or whatever, yeah. what do they typically do? They come by and they give you a free dessert mm-hmm. or they come by and here's, here's $10 off when you come back. Right. Really? I want to come back and have an, Another bad experience for $10 right. less than I'm spending a night. What they do is they placate the customer, but they never fix the process. Why did the, why was the steak not prepared? Right? Why was the potato cold? We've got to go negative and fix that friction to get to the point that we want to be. You, you read in the book, uh, and I apologize for the language, but it is what they use. Oh yeah. I, I, I put on uh, social media. I said, uh, give me, Does anybody out there have any good examples of when going negative made for a more positive experience? And this woman wrote me from Ohio. And interestingly enough, it was a nonprofit. And they have every year a a run to raise money for breast cancer. And what they realized was, you know, working with volunteers, it's easy sometimes for things to slip through the cracks and that. But they realized if they never identified what went wrong, they couldn't fix it for next year's race. Yeah. Yeah. And they wanted to be as frictionless as possible because you're asking people to volunteer their time and to run and to go out and raise money and do all these things. And so they created what they called, again, this is their language, the bitch book. So when somebody came up and bitched about something at the race, they immediately got out the bitch book and wrote it down. Then after the race was over, they always had a meeting and they brought in all the lead volunteers and they went through and they went through every one of the things that had been written down And they made plans a year in advance of how that was going to be fixed for next year's race. And she said, what started out as a three ring binder now is basically one sheet on a legal pad because they've eliminated the friction. And and guess what? As they've done that, more people are running, more money is being raised. And the reason is because just what you and I just did about a restaurant, people started talking about, man, this race is so great. They run it so wonderfully. It's so easy to do it. It's so, and, and the end result is they've raised goodness knows how many thousands of dollars more for cancer research, right? Simply because they went negative and identified the problems and then did what it would take to fix them. Again, this is where people have to realize this crosses every sector. It's not just restaurants and not just car dealers. It covers every sector. If you want to succeed, be iconic. This is the stuff you got to get into. Absolutely. And you got to drill down. Yeah. Yeah. It, I, the devil's in the details. I mean, how many times have we, have we heard that, you know, it, it, it's, uh, the, the great Dr. Dennis Waitley had this great line that he always used to see in his speeches when he said, practice doesn't make perfect practice makes permanent. Yeah. And I, I've always loved that. If I've got a, if I've got a hitch that's bad in my golf swing, which I do, uh, and I go out and practice it on the range and keep doing it. It doesn't mean my swing is going to become perfect. It means I ingrain that flaw into my muscle memory mm-hmm. and therefore it even becomes even harder to change. And, and you know, Rich, one of the amazing pieces of research I uncovered, 
um, there was a study done at uh, Texas A and M, and it 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 advanced the position that SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, that, mm-hmm. that analysis that a lot of companies done have been doing uh, is no longer relevant. And I'm like, how is that? And it's because so many employees are afraid to identify weaknesses and threats to their managers. Wow. Because they don't want to be perceived as being negative. And so they won't tell leadership where the weaknesses are and where the threats are because they, they don't want to be identified that way because many managers are, 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 are so afraid of going negative and hearing negative yes. and, and moving that up the food chain in a bigger organization that the information isn't getting out like it should. So that, that's got to come from leadership. It's got to come from leadership that we want to hear where yeah. is the friction with our customers. The greatest gap in customer experience is the gap between what the leader wants to have happen and what the front line delivers. One of the real thrills I had is there, there's a young leader uh, who said that through my writing, I had become his mentor and helped inspire what he's doing. And the guy's name, you, you, I know you'll know, is Jesse Cole of the Savannah Bananas. Oh, and yeah. Jesse read my, my first book. It was written 25 years ago, All Business is Show Business. And he said that was one of the books that, that we used as kind of our Bible to help us start the Savannah Bananas, and uh, that, that's such a such a thrill because Jesse's such an incredible leader and an incredible guy. But you want to talk about a leader that knows what's happening on oh. the front lines, and a leader that's 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 created a transformational, distinctive, iconic business. And that's the thing. Jesse knows exactly what's happening for for his customers, the thousands upon thousands that are, that are attending the games, and and. I know people will say, yeah, but that's entertainment or yeah, that's, I, I don't think there's any reason that any leader shouldn't know no, no. What, what their customers are experiencing. No, I mean, that's a great example. I lived an hour away from Savannah. I wow. went to the game. I met. Oh, Jesse, no kidding. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I worked in baseball sports management. Yeah. So he took baseball. We took baseball minor league and broad the collegiate league. And we turned it into an event to an experience. He took that on steroids and it's amazing what he has done because the experience is what every kid, every mother, every father is going to remember going home forever. Like the Disney experience. And he's taken baseball and turned it into an experience that the family can enjoy. And you're absolutely right. He knows from top to bottom, from walking in the gate, from going out to your car, he knows it's going to be an experience all night long. It is. What a great it, example. Oh, uh, I, I, I'm so inspired by Jesse, you know, because I, well, I, I was in Savannah and he's taking me around, showing me everything in the ballpark. And, and one of the things that, that struck me is, you know, for 10 years, I did, I, I did movie reviews. I was a syndicated movie reviewer. And so the entertainment scene has always been of yeah. interest to me. And we see what's happened at theaters and it's easy to blame it on COVID, but, but when I hear customers talking today, why aren't you going to a theater? Well, on one hand, the technology of what you have at home is significantly increased. Yes. But the other thing is you go to a movie theater and the price of the ticket is high, but then you're also, how much does it cost to get a box of popcorn? What's it cost to get a Coke? What's it cost to get yeah. the price of concessions, the price you pay after you've paid for the ticket. Yes. It's so extraordinary. Jesse, kind of hears all of this and mm-hmm. it's one price, as you know, yeah. you, you buy a ticket and it and includes the tax. It's not, Hey, it's not tickets are $15 plus tax plus service and convenience charges plus, plus, plus. And it's all the hot dogs you can eat and all the Coke and, and, and you can drink. Well, it's, it's a package. Yes. So, so a mom and dad can take three kids and they know exactly what they're going to spend before they get there. And it's, it's Jesse calls it fans first. And I, it, it, to me, it's, you know, I, I talk about the ultimate customer experience and it's, yeah. it's part of, it's one of the elements that you have to go through to transform, to become an iconic business. And, and gosh, if there is one in America right now, uh, Jesse Cole has it. That's for sure. Oh, absolutely. Scott McCain. This has been amazing, man. I knew we were going to have a great time diving into this stuff. Here's Scott's website. You're going to want to hit the QR code. You're going to want to go there 
and you want to scoop up all the information you can get. So, Scott, what are they going to find when they go to the website? Well, there's a lot of things. There's some free information and ebooks that you can download that gives you uh, more about the ultimate customer experience and what it takes to become iconic. You can sign up for my weekly uh, message that I send out to folks that are subscribers. It's all absolutely free. And if you'd like to, to get more in, in ways of, you know, a virtual uh, training learning program, that's there for you as well. And if there's any way that I can be of service to you or your organization with a speaking presentation, there's info on how to get in touch with me and talk about that as well. So Scott McCain, but, look at that. But not trying to sell you anything. No, Go and no, download please. the free stuff and get the experience. <laughs> I got to make now, sure I say that, you know. <laughs> before I let you go, you have a connection, a personal connection with the Oak Ridge Boys. Yeah. I grew up listening to these guys. And John Basil, who you know personally, you love helping the ALS Foundation because John got ALS. Yeah. Tell me more about your love because I love sharing out the, what we give back, what, what you invest yourself into. So tell me about this relationship you have and why it's so important. Well, I, I, I started at the local radio station in Southern Indiana on my 14th birthday. And it wasn't because I had a good voice or anything like that. It's because my dad and mom owned the local grocery store and they thought they'd buy more commercials if their kid worked there, you know? So, uh, and strangely enough, the manager of the radio station, his best friend in high school sang in a gospel quartet called the Oak Ridge Boys. And they would stop and see him as they were going north on I-65 out of Nashville. So I got to know him just as a, a teenager, uh, and and for some reason we just all hit it off. And and the youngest guy in the group was Joe Bonsell, who was the tenor singer, and he we became I became great friends with all of them, but especially Joe. And uh, sadly, it, it, well, one of the cool things they did is uh, a couple of years ago at the uh, banquet of the National Speakers Association, uh, they performed. But what a lot of folks didn't know was uh, they did it free for me. Uh, wow. yeah, they just said, Hey, if, if you guys can take care of our band so that we don't have to pay them out of our pocket, the four of us will come for free for you. Wow. And so they did. But at that concert, Joe fell on stage and that's was kind of the beginning of when he realized that what he thought was just a bum leg or something mm -hmm. that happened was more than that. And it turned out the, the, diagnosis of, of ALS. And Joe continued to perform as long as he could. I mean, the, many of his performances in the last year were sitting on a stool. Yeah. Uh, he, he just did everything he could. It, it, it affected all of his muscles, except for some reason, his voice. He still can sing as, as brilliantly. He's the guy that sings Elvira. The other yeah. guy, yeah, Richard Sturman is the um papa mama guy, but, but Joe <laughs> sings lead on the others. And and so Joe recently passed away yeah. uh, from, from ALS, but you talk about a guy that had, I, I talked to him a couple of weeks before he passed on the phone and you talk about a guy that just had an incredible spirit. You know, he, he was comforting me because I felt so bad because his end was near that. That's the kind of guy that, that Joe was. So uh, I'm, I'm doing what I can to try to raise money for the ALS foundation mm -hmm. and uh, to honor, to honor not only Joe, but all, all people who have to go through that, that terrible, terrible, uh, disease, that yeah. terrible condition. Well, so we will have the link to ALS and what thank you. Scott is supporting and loving and talk about another iconic uh, Oak Ridge boys. Oh my gosh. You have been surrounded by iconic and I didn't even get to the white house. I didn't even get to the movie. <laughs> You, you, well, you, you, have, you know, we can do this again sometime down the road, Rich. I, you I know, mean, I would love to definitely have you back. There's so much to what Scott has privilege. been involved in, and it wraps around that whole thing of iconic. You've been touched. You've been blessed. You've been dropped into amazing situations, and you've done it with class. Done oh, it with class it. and dignity, my friend. I just want you to know that watching it, reading about it, and peeling back the onion a little bit, you have really, again, go back to the Cabot Award. That's why you got the cabinet. That's been you through and through. And again, it's very, very well deserved. And I appreciate you taking time to be on the show tonight. It's been an honor. Thank you, Rich. I really appreciate that. And I, I really appreciate everybody that's watched and left a comment. And thank you so much for that. And I, I, I look forward to doing this again sometime down the road. You're a blast to talk to, man. I, I, we, <laughs> we, we, 
we'll just have to do that. Next time I'm in your neck of the woods, we need to go out and get to dinner. And, and oh yeah, get it. Come on down. Get connected. I'd love to do that. Count count me in. Scott McCain, there he is, everybody. Thank Scott again for being on the show tonight. And again, Rock the Stage is with you every Sunday night, 7 p.m. Eastern time. We bring you these amazing guests, celebrities, stars, actors, cabinet award winners, and so much more. We want to get the best of the best to help you shine brighter on stage, in your business, and really be inspired by those who are setting the pace. And you do need to check out his books. I'm not going to sell, but I'm going to sell for a second. His books are amazing. They really do help you. Practical insights, practical tools to help you achieve your goals. We're going to be back here next week once again, 7 p.m. Eastern time. We'll go and bring you another rock star guest on Rock the Stage Show. Until then, have a great week, and we'll see you next time right here for another Rock the Stage Show.